One of the joys of bushcraft is that the skills go where we go. They truly are international. Having travelled the rest of the world in this series, I thought it would be nice to finish here at home. In this programme, I want to explore Britain through a bushcraft perspective. One of the things that makes this such an interesting country to study bushcraft in is our ever-changing seasons, because as they change, so does the bushcraft. It's a spectacular and unsung story where looks can be deceptive. In early March, British woodland can seem cold and uninviting with very little going on. But in fact, when you look closely, you discover that Mother Nature's plans are already well advanced. Right now inside these tiny buds, birch leaves are poised, waiting to happen. All they need is one last surge of energy, which they get from the sap beneath the bark. At this time of year, it really pumps up through the tree for just two or three weeks in the year. And that is the ultimate sign the spring has actually arrived. These talents, the bark, provides great tinder for starting fires all year round. The wood is good for carving, a great summer pastime. And in the autumn, the trunk hosts the birch polypore, a fungus that helps sharpen your knife and makes good plasters. And that, for me, is the magic of bushcraft. Once you look beyond the obvious, even the most common things in our countryside take on a new importance and value. No matter where you live in these islands, British bushcraft has something to offer. It's what inspired me to this profession nearly 30 years ago, and it's why I still live here today. So let's start this journey down south in March, early spring. I can't think of any better way to allow the seasons into your life than to come outdoors and camp out amongst the animals and the wildlife itself. incredibly versatile. You can set them up in hundreds of ways. What I've done today though is I've set this up with one side sloping down and one side open to favour the fire. Where you site your camp makes the difference between a good night's sleep and a nightmare. There's a lot of old beech in this woodland and beech trees tend to drop their branches without warning. With a stiff wind blowing, thinly planted areas like this can be pretty drafty. Here I've got some protection. I have a hill there with thick holly bushes on it. That'll protect me from cold air running down, which will be funneled away from me. And I've got good thick cover here acting as a windbreak. So this, this area actually physically feels warm and it's got that nice snug cosy feel that you'd want for shelter. Interestingly, just up on the slope is also where the badgers have chosen to live. So it can't be a bad residence. It's surprising how little it takes to make the woods feel like home. While there's daylight, I can have a scout around and put in a bigger tap for the birch sap. This should make the beginnings of tomorrow's breakfast. This is one of the rare occasions when I don't actually want a piece of wood that's perfectly straight. What I want is that kink, because it's got a purpose. This will make a good funnel for the sap and somewhere to hang my billy can at the same time. 
at this time of year, at the end of winter, when there hasn't been much in the way of green food for a long while, birch sap provides a very welcome drink of both sugar and vitamin C. We know from other parts of northern Europe that that was a really important spring tonic. And modern research has even shown that this sap has cancer healing properties. The average tree could fill this can by the morning and not be damaged by the loss. So if we're lucky, What else is there in early spring in a British forest? Well, it's quiet because the migrant birds are away and only natives like blackbird and robin are singing. It's a good time for spotting early potential too, like this wild garlic, but there's more. Now that's a real surprise. I really wouldn't have expected to see this plant until May. There can be a real benefit in being able to recognize plants before they're in flower and sometimes it even brings rewards. What I found is a pig nut, but it needs careful handling. The stem gets thinner and bends just at the bottom. Now that's only a very small pig nut. They do get sometimes the size of a golf ball. And what you do to eat it, if you just squeeze it between your fingertips, its skin comes away peels away really easy, along with it all the grit and soil, and you can just eat that raw, and they are absolutely delicious. A real spring delicacy. I'm going to use the birch bark to start my fire. But you'll notice that this birch bark is very thin, not like the bark that we used to build the birch bark canoe. The warmer the local conditions, the thinner the skin on the birch tree. Here, very thin, too thin to make birch bark canoes. Great pity. Before I light the fire, I'm going to sweep away all the leaves. Always try to go back to bare earth if possible. Much safer. Easier to tidy up. Wherever you are, however remote or wild it may seem, it's still essential to seek permission before you start lighting fires or camping. But it's worth it. The key thing is to be out here with the wild animals, to see how their lives are, to hear their noises in the night, to smell the smells, to feel the season change. Even the smoke from the campfire changes at each season. If I think about one lifetime, maybe we have 80 years if we're lucky. That's not many seasons to be out. If we only come out in the summer, we've missed out on three quarters of a lifetime. There's nothing worse than a poor night's sleep. To be comfortable out here, you need three things. A bivy bag, which is waterproof, windproof, and yet allows your sweat to escape. A good sleeping bag. And underneath you, most important of all, a sleeping mat. This is an inflatable sleeping mat. And by putting it in the bivy bag, it means you won't slide off of it in the night and wake up with a cold back. That's all there is to it. Now that I've got my roof up, the fire going, I feel really content. And I don't think there's anywhere better in the world than British woodland to spend a night. A few years ago now, I remember lying beside a fire. I was very still reading a particularly good book. And then I heard this sound. I looked up and just the other side of the campfire, about the same distance I was from it, just in the glow from the firelight, 
there was the stripe on the face of a badger coming to investigate. Experiences like that are priceless. And maybe that's why I always seem to sleep better in the woods. When you wake up in the woods, you're already there. You're part of it, like the animals themselves. It creates a tremendous sense of self-reliance and belonging. It's an experience we should all have on a regular basis, just to remind us who we are and where we come from. The real secret of bushcraft is always in the detail. Take the fire, for example. I've planned this to make it easy to clear away in the morning. I knew that the fire would burn out and there'd be the ends of the logs sitting around here. I've taken those and I've burned them off. All I've got to clear away this morning is ash, which is a lot easier than if I had lots of harshly burned big logs or embers. I douse the ash in water and scatter it by hand. It's only by touch that I can be certain there's nothing still smouldering or hot. And because roots can burn underground, I have to check that the ground is cool as well before I can leave it. Nature provides us with the firewood. This is the price we pay, giving a bit of respect back, taking good care of the very thing we enjoy most. And that means leaving a campsite, looking as if no one has ever set foot here. Then it's time to check up on breakfast. That's fantastic. That is the taste of spring itself. It's an amazing liquid. You can do lots with it. You can make it into beer. You can make it into wine. You can even boil it down to a syrup. Although my favorite use of that is to turn it into an ice cube with a little mint leaf in it to drop in a good single malt. Fantastic. Having taken this spring gift of sap, I need to fulfill my part of the bargain. Left untouched, the tree could become infected or bleed to death through the open cut, both highly damaging. So the plug needs to be as long as the drill hole and a snug fit. March, then, has the amazing treasures of early spring. But as nature rolls on and April turns into May, late spring brings its own unique portfolio. I really love this time of year. The forest has come alive. Every leaf, every plant is full of freshness, newness, life, vitality. It reminds me of how precious these things are. It's 
really easy at this time of year to come into the woods and just see the bluebells. But perhaps one of the key secrets to bushcraft is to look beyond the obvious and really see the potential. Hiding in amongst the bluebells are several really useful plants. For example, the, this is a red currant here. And if you look carefully, you can see that the fruits are already developing on there, hinting at the harvest here in a month or so's time. At the base of the red currant are little wood sorrel leaves here, look a little bit like clover, but these grow in the shade and taste like apple peel, delicious. And over here is my old friend the pignut, just coming into flower. Amazons are a very popular wild food because they're easy to identify. There's the beautiful flower and also the pungent smell. But I find that the mature leaves like this are a little bit too strong for my own culinary taste. What I much prefer are the young leaves of the baby plant. These have a much more delicate flavour, much less aftertaste, which is uh, better for the palate. Or the unopened flower bud like that. That makes a surprising, tasty ingredient for a kebab. For that I need a nice straight stick that's green. It needs to be a living stick. If it was dead it would burn. And uh, it needs to be nice and straight, but not just any stick will do. What I need to do is find a stick of a species of tree so that if I trim this it will grow back vigorously. So I'm not going to use beech or a tree like that which is slow growing. What I've got here is a fallen sweet chestnut and because it's fallen there are lots of shoots coming off of it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this close to where the branch itself joins the main trunk. Here, there, in the bark, there's this saddle-shaped scar. And if I cut it here, the bark can protect itself against fungal and bacterial attack. There's a host of different ways to build a fire, depending what you want it for, and our British woods all burn slightly differently. Some give more heat, some more flame, and knowing which does what is helpful. I've got dead beech branches, and I've got some dead withered oak branches, spine oak, which burns like coal. And I'm using those because I want to produce some embers. And uh, that'll burn hot and slow, ideal for cooking. can harbour bacteria and when heated give a bitter taste to your kebab so it's best to clean it off. In good bushcraft the solutions to problems should be both simple and elegant. Salami is a really useful thing to carry with you as an emergency food. It's got a lot of fat and protein in it, which helps to keep you warm. Also, when you cook it like this, it just tastes fabulous.
tell you what, I may not have the flair of the TV chefs, but in terms of flavours, I think I've got a march on them here. For British plants, then, May is all about new green growth. Tender leaves, early flowers, young shoots. Life taking off. In terms of wildlife, it's an incredibly busy month. Hibernating animals are re-emerging, and young ones are starting to appear in a trickle that soon becomes a torrent. Observing the larger mammals of Britain can be really challenging because many of them are nocturnal. But you can gain a fascinating insight into their nighttime activities by piecing together the signs and traces, the tracks they leave behind in the night. The challenge is that it demands an entirely new way of moving and looking at the outdoors. To track, you have to slow down, and you achieve that by switching on your senses and turning up the volume of what you can see and feel around you. What I'm searching for are things that are out of place, things that shout at me, this is not as it should be. Finding those things requires you to be passive, to take in the overall view and let your subconscious search the picture and find them. The harder you look for them, the more narrow your field of view and the less you see. The first obvious sign are these divots that have been kicked up by a pony. And when I look really carefully, I can actually see a tail hair that's come. It even tells me the pony had a black tail. There's also some other hair here, but this is different. This is the hair from a fallow deer. Several nights ago, a fallow deer has laid down here. It could even have been in the daytime, and it's scratched out some of its winter coat, which is what it's left here. At this time of year, the coat is changing from winter to summer. And the, one of the reasons I know this is deer hair is that it snaps really easily. But the majority of sign around here has been made by badgers. The area is strewn with badger holes, more than 15, I'd say, and some of them are active. There are quite a few things around this hole that show me that it's in use. Oh, I look carefully, there, trapped on that root, there's a badger's hair. It's much longer than the deer hair, and it doesn't break. It's not, it's not brittle. It's a little bit springy, rather like our hair. And then there are a couple of other things I've noticed. Here, I've got a piece of bracken frond, and you can see from the moisture that that's been broken off within the last 12 hours. And over here is a bluebell bulb, which has been dug up. Badgers like to eat bluebell bulbs, and sometimes when you walk through the woods, you can hear this crunching sound, like people crunching on pickled onions, and that's the badgers munching on the old bluebells. <laughs> Fantastic sound. This is a real classic sign of badgers. These are claw marks left here. A lot of these would have been made when there was still bark on this tree, and the badgers were searching for insects underneath. I remember on one occasion coming across badger tracks like this, high up on a, on a tree, about five foot off the ground, and it was about that wide, and you could see where they'd gone up and then slid off and grabbed hold of it like a cartoon, and the tracks went straight down, and underneath it was just a drop to the ground. Fantastic sight.
once you've got your eye in for typical badger sign, it's easy to spot other sets. This sand is the spoil from recent digging, creating the perfect oval badger shaped hole. see the badger so I don't want to disturb them too much just want to come and have a look in daylight so I can see where the main holes are gives me a much better chance of spotting the badgers before they spot me but before I get myself settled I have one thing to do recognizing animal tracks is a difficult but useful skill to learn so I'm making a sand trap here on a path the badgers use regularly Hopefully, we'll get good, clear prints by the morning. There's only one thing left now, and that's to choose the place to sit. The first thing I need to do is just test the breeze a little bit. I'll throw these leaves up, and they're blowing back behind me. That's important. If I were to put myself up here, it wouldn't work at all, because my scent would be blown down to the badgers, and I won't get to see them. So what I'm looking for is somewhere on this side here. Where I've hung my coat, there's that beech tree. That looks really good because there's an overhang creating a bit of shadow. And I can lean up against that and be comfortable and still for long periods. So that looks ideal. Yeah, that feels comfortable. I've got a good view of the set. Excellent. All I need to do now is to get dressed so that I'll be warm and check the scent with a little bit more accuracy. This dark woolen jacket is perfect for sitting out. It's warm, doesn't rustle, and because it looks like moss, I'll merge into the background better. to be a high seat in the new forest and somebody, nobody's quite sure who, but somebody had carved in it advice to the stalker of the deer and it said very simply, sit still, look long and hold yourself quiet. And that's very good advice. Advice I'm going to follow tonight. Badgers tend to come out around sunset, so I reckon I've about an hour to wait for them, if I'm lucky. But there's more than just badgers in this forest. And seeing this roe deer proves we're well camouflaged. I think it heard the sound of the camera. Although our eyes work well at dusk, the cameras don't. So just as we were reaching for the night vision equipment, there you go, there's one there just in the shadows, looking straight over this way, sniffing the air, not quite sure. This badge is very cautious. It's like um, it's like they've got a secret party that's about to begin, and they want to make sure that nobody gets to see it but them. It looks like it's the main hole, but then. Central, I 
some cartoon. Their nose leads them everywhere. In fact, badgers are incredibly short-sighted, so they rely on scent to tell them what's happening. All we need now is for one of them to walk in our sand trap. Eureka! <laughs> Even better! I reckon it's time we left them to their party. really nice. The badgers have been very helpful and given us the most wonderful footprints here to have a look at. Here you can see a lovely forefoot of the badger with the claw showing very clearly the long claws they use for digging and you can see look one, two, three, four toes but actually they have five. The fifth toes here you have to look very carefully to see it because they have a wide foot in hard ground that won't always show. It's fantastic to be able to see all this detail. And I think this mark is made by the badger's nose as he's snuffling around for worms and whatever else he can find. And you can actually see there, in there, where the tip of his nose has been, where he's been having a little nose around for things. Wonderful. It's great looking at soft ground because there's so much detail. And once you've seen what sign the badgers are leaving, you can search for that too amongst the leaf mould all around here because it's still to be found there, but it's more difficult. And when you start to see that, then you start to become a tracker. No sooner has late spring arrived than summer is hot on its heels. July really is a wonderful month. Warm sunshine, lush vegetation, and all the summer visitors here. Really couldn't be better. The thing I like most about this time of year is finding a quiet piece of woodland where I can sit tight, practice a few skills, and just relax. And the best way to find that quiet piece of woodland is to climb a hill. When I look at the woods like this, I try to see them through the eyes of our ancestors. And they, of course, knew all of the trees in that forest with intimacy, because they all had a meaning and a relevance. When I look at it, I see it the same way. I see friends, basically, allies in life. You can see there the, the light-coloured trees. That's a willow tree there, good for fire lighting, good for medicine, gives a string and other things. There's a lot of oak, and I can see birch trees, some ash, and various other things. And I think this is part of the magic of, of bushcraft, is it gives you a new view of your surroundings. And so if we're looking for a resource, we can come back outside of the forest, look at it, and find the tree we're looking for. It's often easier to spot it from out here than it is from in the shadows. It completely changes your view of the world around you. And all of a sudden you realize you've got friends just about everywhere you look. What I want to practice among these familiar trunks is carving. Each wood carves slightly differently. Learning how they work is all part of the tools that the Bushman carries in his armory. 
So to show you some carving techniques, I'll make a breadboard from sweet chestnut and string from willow bark to hang it up by. Willow's got loads of uses. One of the things it was very important for in the past was cordage, for making string, something that we take for granted today. And to make string from this, make good string from it, I need one of these shoots that's about that thick, that's slightly thicker than my wrist. And although it's gonna look destructive because I'm gonna chop this whole piece down, in fact, all I'm doing is pr pruning out one branch and this will grow again. And if you harvest this and nurture it, you can have many, many shoots, as many as you need, for all sorts of jobs, basketry, string, whatever. Whatever you take from the forest, I think it's crucial to repay the debt properly. You can do it in a number of ways. One of the things I always do with the willow is when I've taken the, the part that I need for the cord, I'll take some of these young shoots, cut them cleanly off and push them into the ground. There's a very good chance, it being willow, that these will continue to grow and will root and become new trees. And I always make sure the cut is well tidied too, however awkward that may be. Making cord is quite a long process, but Willow is incredibly generous in giving up her bark. What I've got in this pot is some ashes from an old fire. They're a little bit damp, but um, they'll be ideal for the job. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put them in here and boil them up, and that's gonna give me a, a lye solution. And into that, I'll put the strips of bark, and that's gonna affect the bark in a strange way. It's gonna change the color of the bark, but also give it much greater longevity and improve flexibility. I'm taking off the green outer bark because if I don't, it'll dry and shrivel and make all of the fibers brittle and uh, prone to snapping. It's the inner bark that has the real strength. that lovely liquid. Lid on that. And back on. For my breadboard, I need a hardish wood that will split easily. Today, I'm going to use sweet chestnut. smell sweet chestnut it's full of tannin it's got a very very sweet tannin smell it's a lovely smell and very distinctive annual growth rings it's one of the things that sets it out amongst the other woods it's a beautiful wood very easily split it means I need to choose my piece very carefully the half of wood into two boards 
And the piece I'm going to use is going to be this one on the left because the grain is running much more true to the board. It runs through the board. Whereas this one here, we've got the, the, the radius of the grain and that will be much more prone to split along the grain. Whereas this one has strength. I can pare this down to a reasonable thickness if the axe is very sharp. The axe is a marvellous tool for jobs like this, but safety, of course, is paramount. You'll notice that when I'm chopping, I'm chopping from halfway down the board to the bottom, and that my hand is on the side here, protected. I'm not putting my hand over the top. And the obvious reason for that is I don't want my thumb to get chopped off. For the Bushman, sweet chestnut is useful elsewhere too. It's strong, flexible and rots slowly, so it's perfect for making long-term shelters. You have to be careful when you burn it though, because while it splits well, it also spits like mad. The tannin in the wood will pitch your tools unless you clean them well afterwards. To make concave cuts, I tend to use the tip of the blade where it's narrower because then you can turn the blade as you carve, giving you a nice angle. Of course, the blade must be sharp. Carving is hard work when you first start, so it's good to have another job on the go, like my fibres. Just putting this little bit of embellishment onto the piece of wood. It's nice to put a little bit of a bit of extra design work on there. Gives it a bit of character. And then to the string. What I'm going to do? I'm going to bend this in half in the middle, about there. Start to twist the fibres both sides of the middle in the same direction so that it will kink itself and that will become one end of my piece of cord. And then you just keep going. Both strands turned in the same direction will naturally twist together. And that's it for the summer. I'm heading north, far north. Well, seasons have moved on, it's autumn, and there is really nowhere else I would rather be at this time of year 
than here in Scotland. It's magnificent. It's well over 20 years ago now since I first visited the Scottish Highlands in the autumn. It was so beautiful, I've organised a month's work here ever since, just to be a part of it. This whole landscape is great for bushcraft, but my favourite place to start is up in the hills with someone who knows them, looking for the wild red deer. Peter Ferguson is the stalker on the Rothy Mercus estate. How do you feel about working here? Oh, it's very enthused, very enthused. I, I never feel like not getting out of bed in the morning to come to work, which is a, which I'm pretty fortunate with, I think. <laughs> I haven't seen his lordship yet. I haven't seen a big stag this morning yet, no, but might see something further out. Shall we? Yep. That's a fine looking animal, that one. Yeah, he's a good stag. I love these moments when you look out on the animal like that. Yeah, and that's, that's part of the challenge is actually getting close enough to the animal. For sort of 11 months of the year, the stag herds, um, the, the stags and the hinds lead a separate life. The stags are all together and the hinds and calves are all together. For this sort of month, sort of five, six weeks at this time of year, Stags break out from the herd and uh, actually look for a harem of hinds. And this is the main, the main rutting time. Um, a lot of calling or, or roaring, as we say up here. And this is the time of year where you'll actually hear the sort of glens alive with deer. The rot here usually starts in the first week of October, so we're a week or so early, but it's a magnificent sight if you manage to catch it. The wind does need to be on your side though to see any wildlife at all, which it certainly isn't today. I don't know about you, but I'm looking at deer and I've got the wind on my neck, which is just wrong, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's been swirling about all day. Normally by this sort of time of day, you'd maybe ex be expecting the wind to settle in one direction, but, but it makes it very difficult when the wind the winds will change. Yeah, yeah, and they're looking this way and they must have scented us. It's one of those difficult days. I mean, that's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, you absolutely. What, what nature's going to throw at you. Yep. In the valleys that nestle between the highlands, there are other challenges for the followers of bushcraft. While the acres of ancient forest are magnificent, there's also an awful lot of water, not all of it in the locks. This environment is notorious for the moisture that's here, and that can make fire lighting a real problem when you need one. In fact, even Queen Victoria once had a problem with her fire when her trusty manservant, Mr. Brown, couldn't get the fire to burn properly when she was out on a picnic. And that meant that the regal tea didn't get properly boiled and was ruined. So in honor of her, I thought I'd reveal the secrets to lighting fire in the rain. Even though this wood looks sodden, most of it will still be dry on the inside and cut into not free chunks, it can be easily split. And this is the secret for Mr. Brown, if he's up there listening. Split wood burns better than wood which has not been split. 
What I'm making is one of the most undervalued forms of tinder, the feather stick. And I try to bulk up the shavings by starting to make the first shavings move away from my hand by lifting the point of my, my blade, like so. And then I work gr more gradually, bringing the shavings towards my hand by dropping the point. That way I get many shavings in a small area. They're light with a match, but if your matches are soggy too, make really thin, tiny shavings alongside. These will catch from just a spark. I think if Queen Victoria was here today, we could assure her of a good hot cup of tea. If you're wondering why I've lit this fire quite so close to a stream, there's a very good reason. Here, the ground itself can burn. With all this moss in the forest, underneath you get peat. It's very important that we don't light a fire up in the forest itself because we can set the ground alight and it can smolder unseen for months sometimes before coming back to the surface and starting a forest fire. By coming down here onto the gravel by the river, not only is the ground not going to catch fire, but I can put the fire out easily with water from the river and when the floods come, any ash is left. Once again, the woods are calm and they're quiet. This is the time to reflect on the months that have gone and also to get ready for Christmas. With most of the forest taking its winter sleep, it's a bit like wandering into a theatre after a performance. There's a sense of great activity just finished. At this time of year, one of the greatest joys of the woods, for me anyway, personally, is to come out and make a decoration for the coming festivities of the Christmas season. What I want to make is a wreath, and as it's winter, this hazel needs just a little bit more coaxing to make it bend. It helps if you taper the ends. There. So that all sits together quite nicely. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to bind those together. And that willow bark string I made in the summer is perfect. Then it's a matter of just gathering whatever's around for decoration to take back to my bit of winter luxury. Great to have a tent with a stove in it at this time of year, with a long cold evening at this perfect. And there's some real advantages too. A wood burning stove like that with a chimney means that you don't get smoked out, you burn less firewood, and you don't leave any fire scar on the ground. The best thing though is if it pours with rain or it turns really cold, it doesn't matter because that is a real home from home.
mean there's barely time to sort the essentials like firewood and light before darkness falls. But the long evenings prompt the contemplation of the year that has been. I've been able to not only see all of the seasons here in my homeland, Britain, something that's very dear to my heart, but I've also been able to travel to other parts of the world and see not just the good things of bushcraft, like people who still retain the skill of building a birch bark canoe, but I've also met people who are struggling to retain their traditional culture in the face of ridicule and misunderstanding. It was a joy to share the skills of the Algonquin in making their canoes, but the highlight for me must be Venezuela. To be able to teach Saul and Benito to light fire again, to literally rekindle a skill that was lost, well, their joy and mine was overwhelming. Well done, Benito. <laughs> because I firmly believe that far from hurting the planet, the growing knowledge of bushcraft is helping our natural world. When we employ bushcraft skills, it may seem as though we're consuming natural resources. But of course, the more we learn about the trees, the plants, the animals around us, the more we respect them. The more we respect them, the more we cherish them, and the more we nurture and take care of them. That is the underlying principle of bushcraft. Survival in the political wilderness next. BBC Two's evening of comedy begins in just a few moments with Dead Ringers. BBC Four is in Barcelona with a new series exploring contemporary life and culture. That's Tales from Spain, beginning now. And Ray Mears has written a book to accompany his Bushcraft series with a detailed information on survival techniques from cultures around the globe.